Um, I'm so excited to introduce everyone to our two speakers for today's presentation on applying to the NSF GRP. We have with us today two NSF GRP fellows. Our first uh, panelist is Rocio, a PhD candidate in cell biology at Yale University, and Gwenayel, who is a PhD candidate in neurobiology at Duke University and also um, one of our GSMI directors. Um, and just, uh, you know, just a, a really short comment, but I just know from working with them both, they are so incredibly receptive, um, very motivated and extremely helpful. I can't think of any better people than Rocio and Renéel to lead this webinar because they are not just amazing scientists, but also you know leaders in STEM outreach. Um, without a doubt, all of you with us today will learn so much um, from them, understanding the necessary components and things you should address in your own NSFGRP application this year and or the next. And so without further ado, I'd like to welcome Rocio and Renéel. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for uh, the introduction, Daisy. Um, I'm very excited to be here and to share this with a larger audience than um, I was used to in the past years. Um, OK, uh, if Gwenayel doesn't have uh, introducing remarks, I guess we could um, just start with the overview of the presentation. Um, so we are here to talk about the NSF GRFP. And uh, we just want to make sure that we start with the very basics for those of you who uh, might have not heard of the NSF GRFP or are not as familiar with it. Um, so the GRFP is a, a funding uh, program that um, basically tries to help students that are performing research in um, different institutions uh, towards completing their uh, graduate degrees. Um, they just want to help us to um, uh, finish that and not have any issues with funding or anything like that. Um, in particular, they um, encourage women, uh, members of underrepresented groups, uh, persons with disabilities, uh, veterans, and undergraduate seniors to apply. Um, if you don't belong to any of these groups, you can also apply. And I know many of my peers that um, you know do not uh, are not part of any of these groups and still have the NSF JRFP. Um, so the award is uh, provides three years of funding uh, into your graduate school uh, career. And um, essentially, they give you this flexibility uh, where you could have those three years at any time point in a five year period. And that comes really at handy if, for example, you are a senior that is applying to grad school. Typically, grad school programs will have training grants that support you during your first years of your PhD. And so it would be a little redundant to start your NSF um, right away if you have an alternative source of funding um, and you can just reserve your NSF for when that training grant ends, maybe in two years or three, and then you can switch to your NSF and still be funded throughout the five or six or whatever, how many years uh, it takes for completing a PhD. It's also very helpful if you have more than one fellowship um, because it allows you to uh, maybe switch back and forth between the two um, so that you can still, um, you know, write in your CV and put any, everywhere else that you um, have both fellowships. So um, it gives some flexibility in that sense. Um, so the uh, stipend for the NSF JRFP is $34,000 a year. And depending on where you are doing grad school, that can be uh, more than what your peers uh, would be getting uh, from your graduate school or less. Um, but regardless, uh, usually what the graduate schools do is that they match. Um, if 34,000 is less than what your peers are receiving, uh, they try to match it um, and compensating you with some money so that you are equal with your peers. Uh, some institutions even give you a bonus uh, if you get an external fellowship. And that depends on the institution. It depends like how, how long they're gonna give you that bonus and, and how it's going to be distributed. Um, but that's also something that you should keep in mind and maybe uh, try to get that information from your current grad school. Uh, they also cover uh, for the three years that you have funding your uh, tuition fees and that is all managed by the university so you don't have to do anything in particular to um, get that set up. So there are other benefits of being um, an NSF fellow. Um, you have several options uh, if you get the grant. One of those is an access to a supercomputer 
Um, it's very useful, of course, if you have very research um, intensive like uh, computing uh, research uh, projects, for example, um, I don't and I don't have much experience with like trying to access a supercomputer. Um, but it's just something that you, um, you might find handy if that is, you know, the field that you're in. You're also eligible to apply to other fellowships within the NSF. And these are kind of divided into two. Um, one of them is the GROW or the Graduate Research Opportunities Worldwide. And essentially, they fund you to do research internationally for a period of time. I believe the maximum amount of time is one year. Um, and it's great if you really want to learn a certain technique or you want to use a specific type of equipment that your university does not have, you can contact uh, researchers in um, specific lists that the NSF has in countries and specific institutions, and you can apply to that uh, with them and uh, they would fund you uh, to be there and do research for, you know, two months or, or 12 months, whatever, whatever time you need. So that's a great opportunity. Um, they also have uh, other more non-academic fellowships um, or internship programs. Um, the intern program or GRIP, as I think they're uh, calling it now, is an opportunity for the fellows to do an internship in organizations that are non-academic. So these can include, um, you know, uh, national labs or other federal agencies. They can also include um, nonprofit organizations and uh, startups. And um, it's a great opportunity for those of us who maybe want to explore different career options or just want to be exposed to different things during uh, grad school um, education. Um, last but not least, of course, uh, applying and having the NSF GRFP uh, does make you uh, more desirable uh, in a sense to like uh, be in grad school. It, it's good that the universities know that you're trying to get these external fundings, um, your PI will also be happy that you know you have funding with you. And at times, you know, if you really want to be in a lab and it just comes up that they don't have you know the, the money to pay for one more person, it could really be advantageous to have this because then it just doesn't become an issue. Um, so there's just some of the benefits of um, having the NSF GRP. Okay, moving on to eligibility. So there are a couple of things to be um, considered to be an NSF fellow or honorable mention. So the first one is you have to be a US citizen, national or permanent resident. So if you are an international student, um, check to see like what your residency is or your resident status is before applying. And then the next thing is um, for college seniors who are planning on applying to graduate school, you can apply like in your senior year, but then that also means that you would have to be either matriculating into graduate school like that following year. So like if you're graduating in the fall of 2020 that you would be intending to matriculate in the fall of um, 2021. And then also you have to be a first or second graduate um, student. So you're only allowed to apply once in graduate school. You used to be able to apply multiple times, but this rule recently changed like maybe two years ago or so. And how the NSF works is you're actually um, scored compared to your year group. So if you are an undergraduate senior, all of your applications would be in reference or relative to the other seniors. And so as you have more experience, then you are considered to be more competitive. But let's say you're an undergrad and you've been doing lots of research and maybe you have like publications and a really good mentor who would write a strong application for you. Maybe you should consider applying in your senior year because as a college senior, you can still apply again in graduate school. So you're not missing out. But if you are a first year who might not have that much research experience, or you're not sure, it might be better to apply in your second year of graduate school. And then also um, completing post -backs, masters, or other professional degrees do make you ineligible to apply during your PhD. But there is a small like workaround with that. So if you did a post back and 
it doesn't count as like a master's. There are some dual degree programs like that. So if you did a post back, then you might still be eligible to apply for the NSF. Or let's say you started a master's program, but you didn't complete your master's program, then you can also still apply for the NSF. It's it's the actual degree that counts because the master's is a part of graduate school. So they want to see that you haven't done that much schoolwork before applying to the NSF. And lastly, MD PhD students or other dual degree students aren't eligible. So like MD PhD, JD PhD, um, there are some like business degrees that um, are applied with PhD that are also ineligible. So somebody had asked a live question about that. So no, MD PhDs are not eligible for the NSF. Uh, Gwenielle and Rocio, we have um, several questions. So the first question is from Sandra and they, they ask, can I apply if uh, I'm currently a postdoc, not a student? Um, so there are some restrictions, I believe. I think it depends on how many, uh, if your postdoc, uh, postbac is, um, includes completing graduate student courses, uh, those do count in terms of your graduate school months. Um, so I think it's very dependent on your situation. They do have in their page a very thorough, frequently asked questions. And there's questions about all of that. If I'm a postback and I'm taking graduate school classes within my postback, um, does that count or not, for example? Um, so I would recommend you to go to the uh, frequently asked questions and uh, try to see if you can find that answer. And if not, you can just email one of us and we can help you figure that out. Mm -hmm. Awesome, thank you. Um, another question. Um, so they ask, can I apply if I'm thinking about a master's on medical physics? Uh, could you actually elaborate on that? Like, do you mean that you want a separate master's and not a terminal degree like a PhD or um, you are thinking about applying for the NSF and then at a different point in time getting a master's. And then going on to Lucy's um, question, if you're not in a program right now and you finished a bachelor's, you can still apply for the NSF if you are um, planning on matriculating into graduate school. So if you're actively applying to graduate school right now, in your application, you will have to fill out a brief questionnaire of just like, this is what I've done in my gap year or like gap year or gap years. Um, so you're not gonna be penalized for that. So yes, you can still apply. Yeah, so um, going along with that, we had a question from Gania. Um, they asked if you have graduated and applying for fall 2021, Will that count as undergrad or grad? That would be counted with the undergraduate cohort because unless you've completed graduate school work, then you are still considered in the undergrad category. Yeah. Um, Andrew asks, is it why is it more recommended to apply as a second year graduate student compared with first year grad student? Um, and that is a good question. I think ultimately it's always your choice and your PI's choice, you know, if you want to talk about that. Um, because you can only apply once in graduate school, you have to think about would I have better letters of rec from this place, for example, where I'm right now I'm very new to this place, maybe in a year I'll have a lot more people that can write me better letters of recommendation. Will I have more data in my project that maybe will allow my research proposal to be better? Um, so that is just a suggestion of things that I think you should uh, talk, have a conversation about if it's uh, more beneficial for you to apply as a second year than a first year. But you can absolutely apply as a first year too and first year students get the grant. So it's not a you know either or situation. Yeah, and following up with um, what Rosiro said about the first versus second year, as a second year, that's usually when people are starting to um, declare their thesis lab. So you have a more consistent mentor as your PI rather than doing rotations in your first year. And so by that point in time, it's also 
likely that you've had more guidance from the person who's going to be your mentor for the rest of your PhD. And you also have probably had some experience either like reading grants or writing grants or writing scientific papers at like a graduate school scientist level as well. So your writing is probably also going to be a little bit better. And also with the NSF, it is not necessarily data driven. So what you propose for your application does not have to be what you actually do for your PhD. But just even having that um, foundation, like Rocio said, of knowing how your science is and like how to write about it in a way to articulate this is my next step and this is my rationale why, that comes with years of experience as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you guys so much for, for all the questions. Um, I guess we'll take one more question and then uh, we'll, we'll proceed. Um, so uh, I, I think going along with um, uh, the undergraduate you know, experiences, so Kiara and Gabriel, they both, um, their questions are very similar. And so Kiara asks, is it still a good idea to apply as an undergrad with limited research experience? I, I would say go for it because you can also apply as a grad student. Um, so you're not losing anything by applying. Um, you know, just make sure that you, you put on the strongest application you can. I don't think it, you know, if you have some research experience and those PIs can attest to you, you know, uh, growing as a scientist in their lab and stuff like that, it doesn't matter, I think, how much research experience you have as an undergrad. Um, but you don't lose anything by applying because you can still apply again when you're in grad school. So I would go for it. Mm -hmm. And along with that, there was another question. So do you suggest applying in undergrad if you're also applying to other fellowships, such as a Fulbright? I don't see anything wrong with applying to multiple fellowships, especially since a lot of them are going to be asking for the same types of statements. So like you're going to need a personal statement and I've never applied to Fulbright, so I'm not really sure what that consists of. But if you are thinking about your research, already contacting people for letters of rec, it's not going to be that much additional work for them to basically like copy and paste like Fulbright to NSF or supporting you as a scholar and an independent thinker. So I think there's nothing wrong with it. And it also shows that like you're ambitious and that's something that you could mention when you're um, doing your interviews for graduate school that like, hey, like I've applied for X, Y, and Z and you might not know your status by then, but at least you've applied. So there's no harm in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Alrighty. Um, Alrighty, yeah. So take it away. Okay. All right. So during this last year, there have been some updates for some of the things that NSF is prioritizing for the GRFPs. And there are three high priority areas. The first one is artificial intelligence. The second is quantum information science. And the last and third is computationally intensive research. So this does not mean that if you're not in one of these three disciplines that you can't apply, of course, still apply anyways. But if you are in one of these subsections, that means that like, your review process is gonna be slightly different because this is what is called in science, like a call for action. And so these are areas that um, usually outside donors or other people are explicitly putting separate money aside for these research grants, but that's not gonna take aside or take away from grants or applications in let's say life sciences or engineering or like geosciences, like please still apply to your respective major. Um. And then for the application process, so there are four major components. The first is a personal statement. 
the next research statement, a minimum of three reference letters, and then also your academic transcripts, so undergrad and graduate if applicable. And then there are a couple of deadlines. Um, so each of these are due for 5 p.m. for your respective time zone. So like if you're on the East Coast and 5 p.m. Eastern time versus if you're like in Central time, then it would be 5 p.m. Central. And they separate out the deadlines for each respective discipline. So life science is traditionally the first deadline. Um, so this year it's gonna be October 19th. And then following up, um, there's usually a slight separation between engineering and um, like computational and engineering psychology. So you can see the deadlines for each of these fields and make sure you're paying attention to what um, broad category that you're applying to, because if you visit the NSF application website, it'll say something like life sciences and then underneath they'll give um, brief description. So it'll be like life sciences dash neuroscience or life sciences dash cellular biology. So you might think that like you're in life science because you're, let's say, organic chemistry or something, but that actually might be under a different broad discipline. So just pay attention to your deadline. And these are more dates for the actual like NSF review process. So in um, late July, early August, that's when the, um, it's called a program solicitation or just the notification that like, hey, like apply to the NSF, this is what our program is. And so that's just a general announcement to the public in early August. So actually now the fast lane application is open so you can start working on your application online and you can save your progress as you go so like you have a password and login so you can just visit your application as much as you want and you don't have to submit or save as a draft every single time you log in and out and late october early november that is when your application is due depending on your discipline for this year, October 30th is the deadline for reference letters to be due. So it's usually um, about a week after your application is formally due to the NSF. So if your letters of rec aren't in when you actually submit your application, let's say October 19th, like you don't have to panic, your reference letters have about a week to do so, but please like keep reminding them and then in early April, that's when the awards are announced. So I think for my year, I actually found out like April 1st, which kind of freaked me out because it was April Fool's Day. And I was like, don't play with me. <laughs> like, do not play with me. And then you have to accept your fellowship by um, early May. I think the dates like fluctuate between May 1st and like May 15th. And um, there are also options to like defer your NSF. So if you don't want your NSF to start in um, fall 21, you can just say like, I accept, but I want the NSF to start in like fall 2022. And so you just have to like indicate that information. Yeah. Um, before we move on, I just wanna answer um, two questions that I see. Uh, so someone is asking about the supercomputer time. Um, I didn't look up to see if this year uh, that was an option. I do remember that it wasn't clear to me at all while I was applying that that was a thing. So it might just be that it's not something super obvious. Um, but once I got the grant, you start getting all these emails about, um, you know, all these other resources. But I can look that up and uh, make sure that it's posted somewhere um, if it's different this year. Um, and then I think, let me see, there's a lot of questions now. Do we want to answer a few of these before we move on to the next? All right. Okay. Uh, would computational neuroscience count as computational intensive research? Um, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, um, I, I think, oh, sorry, um, go ahead. 
I mean, I, I feel like if you are using anything that is computational, then that, you know, it doesn't matter. I think like if it's 30% computational and like 70% wet lab, if the computational part is very in depth, like it, it probably counts, but I don't know. Yeah. And then also with computational research, like there is a lot that still is counted under computational. So if you're somebody who is more, let's say, theory based or mathematical modeling, maybe that might not count under the computational intensive research. So I would recommend looking under the description of these are the types of research that count under that because I think on the NSF website they do list like what they consider to be intensive research or computationally intensive research. Mm -hmm. So um, Amanda's asking us to recommend for other majors to modify their applications based on these new revisions. Um, I think that's a tricky line. Like I wouldn't go out of your way to do that because I think it could fire back. Like if you're stretching too much just to fit in one of those descriptions, like I think that isn't necessarily the best thing to do. So unless you can easily uh, kind of fall into one of those categories, I don't think I would recommend personally doing that. Um, yeah. So I had accidentally clicked on um, the answered portion, but Elizabeth um, Torres, um, they have asked, I'm a first year PhD student. I already have an advisor and she started giving me feedback on my research plan this summer. Um, I planned for her and the supervisors I had as an undergrad to give me recommendations. Wouldn't it be harder to get it in my second year? I know this is very specific, but just wondering if you could answer that. I think that's up to um, how you think that one, your advisor is actually going to help. Um, if it's going to be something that if you and your advisor now already seem to have a good relationship and they're giving you lots of feedback and they're helping you with your writing and they're not just kind of like hanging you out to like drive like, oh, you could read this paper on your own. Like you can do this. Like you're, you're a smart person, which is still true like I'm sure you're very intelligent but like in, in terms of grant writing it does help to have people like go through multiple edits with you to help you like come up with like okay this is my aim this is what I want to do because I think with the NSF it's a little bit tricky just because you really have to stress brevity um you get two pages and that's it for your research plan and that's something that I struggled with of just even being able to write it. So if you are confident that like your advisor is really gonna like help you out and you have a really good relationship with your undergrad mentors, then it sounds like you're in a very good place as a first year and I don't see a harm in that. But also like if you start getting to let's say late September, early October and you're like not feeling so confident, I don't see the harm in waiting for next year either assuming that like you and your advisor will still have a good relationship which you probably will mm -hmm. definitely um it's okay so we have some of the questions regarding recommenders um that i see so mariana asked do your recommenders have to be your past pis or mentors what about a stem professor who didn't see you in a research setting um, so we're going to, we're going to talk specifically about recommendations later on. Mm -hmm. Um, I can give my opinion. I, I always try to get mentors, um, just because they can speak more, um, in terms of my ability as a scientist and like, uh, things like that, that I think would be, I don't know. I think it's, it's kind of what they're looking for, but, uh, if you have someone that knows you extremely well and they they also know you in these capacities even though they're not you know they were not your uh particular pi um i don't see why you couldn't do that i just always tend to go with my past mentors um and provide them good information so they can speak about other aspects of my life too um if those include like outreach or other things so um but that's that's my opinion about that. Thank you. Okay. 
yeah, so we're going to be uh, discussing a lot of um, the topics and subjects you, you, you guys have mentioned in the questions. And so we'll also be addressing them as we move along the presentation. Okay. So um, let's move on to some of the application components. And um, basically there's two big statements. One of these is your personal statement and the other one is a research statement. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the personal statement and what kind of um, helped me write a good personal statement and just like be as concise, but um, very pointed as I could um, with my statement. So overall, this is kind of your letter of presentation to the reviewer. So they're trying to learn uh, a bit more about yourself. And um, of course, like, you know, talking about your education and your past research experiences and all that is important, but they also wanna know who you are. Um, and that can include many different things. You know, I wrote about like music because that, you know, that, that is a big part of my life. And, it was something that um, I, I found a good way of like, uh, just kind of like adding that to my story and, and fitting it into what um, my, my story of becoming a scientist was and everything. Um, so don't be afraid of talking about those things because that's, that's kind of what the research, uh, sorry, the personal statement is about. Um, don't be afraid to like write personal things in there, you know, and just make it unique because if that's who you are, then that's that's what they want to see. They want to see who you are um, on this research statement. So um, you should talk, of course, about your education, uh, your professional development, like how do past research experiences helped you, um, and not necessarily go into the nitty gritties of well, like I learned how to do like confocal microscopy in my second year, like. Um, focus more on like what those things, what you learned from it in terms of how has it helped you now be a better scientist, like it, it helped you, I don't know, mentor someone else, for example, if you had that opportunity, um, how did that made you a better scientist, um, just focus on those things instead of like the technical things that you learned. Um, you should talk about how graduate school is going to help you uh, reach your career goals. Um, and I would also lay in there, how is this fellowship and getting this fellowship is going to help you be a better scientist, uh, complete your project, be successful, be more competitive for X, Y, Z thing that you want to do in the future. Um, so kind of always try to bring it back to like getting this fellowship will put me in a better position to change the world essentially, or whatever you want to do. Um, so, uh, they also um, say that it's important to talk about how, how is this going to benefit society? And it doesn't necessarily um, have to be throughout your research specifically, but how um, uh, through yourself, like how you as a person will benefit society if you reach your goals, if you finish this PhD, like what, what do you want to do that is meaningful and that will impact society in the future? Um, so two things that they always talk about um, in both the personal and the research plan is intellectual merit and broader impacts. Um, so intellectual merit is essentially how are you going to advance knowledge um, in, in your career as, as yourself? Like how do you envision yourself um, uh, just up contributing to, to the field um, and society in general? So um, here you should talk about those research experiences. Um, you should talk about why are you doing this? Like why is science important to you and why, why do you chose this career? Um, why are you choosing a PhD in your particular area of, of research? And do you plan on, on maybe expanding on that in the future um, or why not? Um, Essentially, just make a story, you know, make a, a good story that um, will intrigue them, but also will let them know that you um, have all of these, you know, plans and, and things and how uh, you are going to impact society. And the broader impacts, um, like I said, um, it's essentially how are you going to advance uh, the society? And uh, Gwen Ayel and I and, and Daisy talked about this a little bit more in some of our practice sessions that, you know, if you belong to underrepresented groups, um, I think it's, it just, it goes without saying that just by being in grad school, you're already doing that. 
So don't feel like you have to go out of your way to kind of be like, I'm going to do like all these things while I'm in grad school um, and like, you know, do all these outreach things. And I know most of us will just because that's just kind of what we like to do. But um, just don't feel that pressure that you have to um, have all these things because just just by being here and, um, you know, uh, doing what you're doing, um, that's that's already impacting society in meaningful ways. Um, so yeah, talk about other things that you also do, um, if that is something that you do um, that is impacting society. And just overall, um, you know, uh, talking about these things really um, kind of show them that you, you know what you want to do with your life, even though that's not true or like not true for some of us. Um, but, you know, just showing that confidence that like, you know, where you're going with your life is, is a good thing. Um, as true or not true as that might be, but that's in general, like a good advice for writing this. For CEO, we actually have a question uh, related to broader impacts um, from Nicole. Um, can broader impacts go further than graduate school? Maybe how you achieve that as a uh, professional? Yeah, for sure. Uh, we talked about that. I, I definitely wrote it in that way in my statement, just like how I want to be a faculty, for example, or, or do whatever you want to do. And then you could even say, you know, after I'm, I'm in that position of power, wherever I am, like I could have more, um, I can affect change more effectively than what I am, you know, where I am now as a grad student. Um, so that can go as broad as you want it to go. Like I, yeah, there is no limit. You can just talk about it in 30 years from now if you want that, so. Thank you. There was also another question that asked, can you explain how you personally tied music and research? And I would love to hear that too. Oh my God, it's so embarrassing. <laughs> um, <laughs> for a science project in elementary school, my mom wanted me to do like the boring, no offense if someone has done this, all of us have, putting that little seed in different environments and seeing like where it grows more, whatever. And I, I think it was the first time, I think I wrote it that way because I mean, it's true. It was the first time that I was like, no, I wanna ask my own question and I'm gonna do my own thing. And so I wanted to see how music affected growth in plants. So I like expose them to like, metal rock and rap and uh, classical music and like all these different things. It was not a controlled experiment at all. But you know, I did my thing and it was just like the first sciencey thing I did by myself where I was like tying it to something that I, I loved. So that's the embarrassing story. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so do we want to answer a few of these before we move on to the research plan? Um, let's see. Okay. So we'll be talking more about the priority areas. Um, but Sandra asks, how would you recommend to ask mentors for letters of recommendation if they are already writing you letters for graduate school? Um, and if they are unable to write you letters, would it be a good idea to ask staff who are not in the research field? Um, Um, so I think it, it might be, if they're already writing a letter for you, you know, that might be a good thing, uh, cause they're already putting in the work. Although I have had mentors that I don't want to go there, but essentially I know that sometimes they can be, have a little pushback if you're asking for too many letters, uh, but don't be afraid. Like that's part of their job, um, <laughs> you know, as faculty. And you know anything that you can do to make the that process easier. When uh, I all can even like speak about how she has like experienced writing uh, some of her own letters. So if that's something they're open to do, and if that's gonna you know make the burden less on them, then like maybe that's something you can bring up. Um, yeah. Also with writing letters, um, sometimes you have to kind of like slightly suggest what you want written in your letter so some PIs will ask you for your CV for example and like they'll just kind of like copy and paste these things and like, well is the president of 
this organization or when I all participates in outreach here, but sometimes your PIs don't know what you do outside of lab. And especially for the NSF of all things that has a lot of weight or interest in broader impacts, it's very, very helpful for you to explicitly say like, hi, like I'm Daisy, this is what I do. I work with Scientifico Latino, I work with this. This is what I do in my free time. This is how science, especially if you don't have the relationship with your PI that like you talk about those things. Um, also, I've written a lot of my own letters of rec. I'm happy to share like my before letter of rec and then my after, like after my PI had put their own spin on it, if people want to see what that looks like. So those are some of the tips, like tell people explicitly what needs to be in the letter. So the stuff, it talks about broader impact. So it's going to be different than a graduate school letter of rec instead of it being like this person can do good science and I think they should be at your school the NSF letter has to be like this person can do good science and I do think that they're going to change the world and I think that they're amazing and I think that they're going to like really like be an amazing person to diversify the field of science like it has to be additional things mm -hmm. yeah. make it super easy for them to write you a good letter um, and we can go back to that um, later in the talk for sure that's a great question, by the way. Um, okay, uh, let's see. So we have a couple questions regarding um, the high priority areas, but I see a question related to the research plan statement. Um, so how? So someone asks, how do you come up with a research plan? Is this something you create with a potential PI? Um, and the same person asks, I should add that I am a senior and undergrad for the last question, this is why I don't have a research plan. Okay, well, perfect, because this is the part that we're at now. So um, <laughs> for the research plan, the research plan is an original topic that you want to pursue in graduate school. And one of the great things about the research plan is, again, this does not actually have to be the experiment that you pursue. So, um, and talk about maybe let's say like a general question that you have or if this is something that like the PI that might be helping you write this um, application so let's say like you're an undergrad and no this isn't going to be your thesis mentor but like hey like I think this project's really cool let's talk about it um so the most relevant part about successful research plans is it's something that is well thought out in terms of asking a unique question and unique question just means like this is a problem that exists in society and we haven't solved this problem so like here are some of the things that I think we could do to get to the root of that question and also making sure you're trying to emphasize that we want to advance knowledge not just for the field of science but also people like who interact with science and so whether that's eventually going to help people in other fields or eventually help people in medicine, of course, this is not something that like you talk about diseases or something, but like just emphasizing that we do not know how this thing works. And this is how I propose to find that out. Mm -hmm. Oh, and this is also a page limit of two pages. And then for the research plan statement, um, if you are, let's say like a senior in college, you could talk about like your project from senior year, or again, you could come up with like a brand new project. If you are a first year student, you might not have joined a lab yet, you could talk about a rotation project, or again, brand new project, come up with something that you're really interested in. And your interest with like other people's strengths so if you are somebody in neuroscience like me like even though I was a biochemistry major in undergrad I wouldn't go to like my biochemistry professor who is not a neuroscientist and be like here's my neuroscience like research proposal like what do you think because they just be like I don't really know how to help you like sounds good maybe but like make sure you're asking people 
people who already have the skill set that they can help you. And the general formula that people use is an introduction to the general problem or the question that you're asking. So um, right now in the world, people see X. X is a problem. We don't know why X happens. And then you can break down into, let's say, two to three specific aims and goals of, I will try to understand X, one, two, three, and then talk about the broader impact. So like, once I figure out why X is X, then this will help the entire field of whatever your science field is. And then significance, the significance of understanding X means that now we can make better technology or better like science or whatever it is. And there are also some examples of what the NSF fellowship funded fellowships in multiple different fields and disciplines. And then the last part before this, so you do not have to um, actually execute the proposal that you submitted, even if you are funded. And then if you work with any sort of like disease context, do not say that I want to solve this disease or I want to understand this disease. There is a way that you can talk about disease without explicitly saying disease. And so if you are working on something like that, talk about the biology or the engineering or the chemistry that underlies that disease rather than talking about the disease itself. And Rocio and I were actually going to give examples from our own um, research statements about that. So I see that we have some questions coming in, but I think that we'll answer them as we go through our own statements. Mm -hmm. And lastly, you can um, submit for a major field of study. So this is the broad category. So for, for me, my broad category was life sciences dash neuroscience, but you also can submit your application as an interdisciplinary application. So you can um, select up to three additional areas. And I believe like when you actually submit it, it will ask you for like a breakdown of percentages. So, um, for my application, I did 50% biomedical engineering, 30% neuroscience, and 20% cellular biology. And the most important thing is you want to think about who is going to understand your research question the best. So the reason why I did mine for more biomedical engineering instead of neuroscience was because my lab, we use a lot of machine learning and um, like computational methods and electrical circuits and electrical engineering. And so even though my, my question was based in neuroscience, my techniques were like majority engineering. So that's why I did it that way. But um, when you are submitting your application, if you are funded, you have to be studying or planning to study in your major field of study. So going back to my example, I couldn't say I'm going to submit my major field of study in, let's say, geosciences because I'm not like a geoscientist, like I'm in neuroscience. And very quickly, so I applied in my second year of my PhD. So this was in 2017. I'm a first gen student. So like my parents, they're from Haiti and Dominican Republic. Um, I'm also a first gen college student, first gen graduate student, first gen American, like I'm just first gen. Some, somebody had asked about like publications or like research experience. So I had zero publications when I applied to the NSF, like nothing, like nothing on my CV, like nothing in progress. Like I had nothing to say. I was just like, all right, like, I don't know what to tell you. And then I also, I had zero years of cumulative research. So cumulative research is, let's say you work in a lab as an undergrad, you work there throughout the semester. I never did that. I actually worked 
when I was in school um, to like pay for my tuition. So like, it didn't make sense for me to work in a lab when I needed money, like in real, in real time. So I was like, I'm not doing research. So I only ever did research over the summer. I had three different um, summer research experience, one at the Jackson Lab um, in Bar Harbor, Maine, one at the University of Chicago, and one at Duke University. That was my last summer. And um, Duke is actually where I'm doing my PhD now. And I did a lot of science and community outreach. So when I was in undergrad, I worked at a whole bunch of different places to either do outreach for um, STEM at the elementary school level, or I also was a teaching assistant and a tutor in biology and chemistry. So that's more college level. And then when I got to graduate school, I still continued outreach and I did a lot of work with like elementary, middle and high school. Um, so um, a little bit of when I applied in 2016, um, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. Um, I did all my education there, public school um, up to college. I am first generation in graduate school, but not in um, undergrad. I had two years of cumulative research from my undergrad institution. Um, and it was in plant biology, which is like so far away from what I'm doing now. So it doesn't really matter what types of research experiences you have. If it doesn't line up at all with what you're doing now, it doesn't matter. The important thing is that you are trying to get those research experiences and just being in a lab. Um, that's what's most important. Um, I did have two summers of research experience um, in summer programs. And um, like I mentioned before, I really chose to uh, write in my personal statement why, how these helped me be a better scientist and prepare me to be successful in my PhD career now. I didn't go, like I mentioned, you know, I was trying to answer this question via these methods, but that was pretty much the extent of it. Um, they're also, remember, if you're going to ask them for letters, they might speak about the projects a little bit more. So you don't have to go in depth that much um, in your personal statement when talking about past research experiences. Um, I was very fortunate that I had one publication from one of those summer programs. They like just happened to use one image I took. And so um, they put me in a paper. So I did have like an undergrad uh, paper, but that is, you know, super rare. Um, and it, I, I don't think anyone has those expectations that, you know, you will have papers as an undergrad. So do not be discouraged by that at all. Um, as you can see, Gwen Ayel uh, didn't have any publications and like she's a super successful scientist. So like that doesn't mean anything. Um, so I was in, very involved in my undergrad in science outreach. Um, super involved, so I talk about those things uh, more because I, I actually applied my first year. It was the last year that you could apply twice. So I talked a little bit more about those because I was coming from undergrad. Um, I, I didn't get it my first year. I got um, honorable mention and then I reapplied my second year and I had um, a different proposal. You know, I had more uh, experience at Yale and more um, uh, outreach uh, things that going on at Yale. I was mentoring uh, undergrads and involved in women in science at Yale and other minority groups. So um, I definitely think that helped uh, to an extent. And I also talked about my career goals, um, how I do want to um, become faculty and advance minorities and scientists as a Latina um, faculty me member. And that's somewhere in the future. Um, so that's just a little bit of who we were at the moment we were applying and the things we talked about in our personal statements. And I don't know if we wanna answer a few questions before going or if we just go through a research um, statement and then go back to questions. Yeah, let's just answer some questions regarding the high priority areas that we've discussed. And do y'all see why I say that these two women are like, you know, badass scientists and incredible women and leaders and STEM average like I just and that was them before like them now like um and I also see a lot of uh Puerto Rico representation yes <laughs> okay <laughs> so we had a question from a while ago um so Armin so they asked for these you know these uh three high priority areas um do you select one of these categories to apply to or do you select the field that you're applying into and then emphasizing 
one of these priority areas in your research statement. Um, so for example, um, uh, Armin asks, says, I am applying to psychology, but emphasizing a machine learning approach in my research statement. Uh, I think the areas are not actual categories to apply to, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think those are just things that are in your proposal uh, that you can talk about and probably check a box somewhere maybe this year. Um, they just want to filter it through that. And, um, but I think you still choose your topic, you know, engineering or like biology or whatever it is. And then you, um, you know, check, I, I assume, I'm not sure this is a new thing. So I am, I'm assuming you have to check mark that at some point or talk about it in your, um, in your statement. Okay, and then we have an, a related question. Um, so Chin Wendu asks, if your field is within these high priority areas, would there be supplemental applications to be completed or submitted? Yeah. Hmm. Um, I assume no, this is new. So everything we're saying is just like, who knows? But I don't think they want to read more things. So I, I think they probably, you know, like I said, will make you check some something somewhere. Uh, but I don't think you'll have to submit, you know, like, of course, you have to demonstrate that, you know, you will be doing your research in some of those areas, but you can do that in your research statement. But I, I'm not sure about that. So I'm sorry, we can't really like expand more on that specific thing. Yeah, it is just like a checkbox that like, this is the field that I'm in, just like any other um, of the fields. There is an additional section, but it's not supplemental materials in terms of like writing an, an additional statement. It's just when you go to the NSF application portal, there's going to be a section that's like, are you in one of these three areas? And then you would just select it if you are. And if you're not, then like, you just know. Mm -hmm. Um, and we also have questions regarding the interdisciplinary fields uh, portion of the application portal. Um, so in the chat box, so Kenneth asks, how do you choose a major field if you're applying to a graduate program that is interdisciplinary? Hmm. I think it's probably based on your research plan and not necessarily where you're going to apply. Um, Cause that's ultimately that's what they're funding and like, you know, it can change you know, you, you could end up in a different PhD program. Uh, but I think that uh, based on your research plan, you should choose what topic fits better with that. And if it's interdisciplinary, you can also uh, do like when I L did and, and just like write, you know, this is 70% this and 30% that. So um, it's not like you can't integrate that into your application. Right. I think the most important thing is just making sure your major field of study is actually what you're going to be doing in graduate school. So like, I wouldn't do my major field of study as cellular biology, even though my application did have a lot of cell bio because my degree is in neuroscience, then that would be a problem. But the reason why the interdisciplinary um, application is good to include if your application does include multiple fields is it actually helps NSF decide who reads your application. So for example, me in neuroscience, there are so many different subfields, just like any other field that is like, if you're in chemistry, there's organic, there's um, physical, there's analytical, there are all these different subsections. And so if I already said explicitly, like mine includes engineering and pharmacology, and neuroscience, then they're going to try to find people who are familiar with those areas rather than having somebody who doesn't know anything about that. And then they read your proposal and they're like, uh, I'm going to score this person lower just because I don't understand. They're going to try to align your review process in the way that you have the best potential of reaching people who understand what you are proposing. Mm -hmm. Um, but I see that we have a lot of questions related to the research plan statement. Um, so we'll be addressing those in examples. Um, but I see a question that relates to 
um, you know, the, the project being really biomedical, you know, uh, based. And so Andrew asked um, if I'm interested in applying to a PhD program in either pharmaceutical sciences or bioengineering, am I at a disadvantage to state that I'm interested in applying to a farm science PhD programs in my statement since farm side programs are biomedical based? Absolutely not. So like my project is like literally engineering and pharmacology. And so um, we're about to go through like our specific research plans. So I can actually go through my statement and show you how I finessed like talking about a disease model without ever explicitly saying the disease model. So um, Daisy, Rocio, if you guys wanna do that and then we can come back to the questions later. Like, does that sound good? For sure, yeah. Okay, so here is an example of the application that I actually submitted. So this was my research plan. We have two slides, so like it shows our full statement. So on my first page, like the title of my proposal was identifying a role for dopamine D2 receptor signaling in the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex control of executive functioning. So what, what my project actually is, I look at drugs, so pharmacology for treatment of schizophrenia. So schizophrenia is a psychiatric illness and um, the symptoms of schizophrenia are, lot, are largely cognitive. So a lot of people have memory loss, a lot of people have um, problems paying attention, problems controlling their emotions. So all of that is considered cognitive functions or executive functioning. And so even though I'm interested in schizophrenia, what I did was I talked about dopamine and dopamine is basic science because it's like, this is a a neuromodulator, you could talk about cell signaling, you can talk about where it's represented in the brain. And there's so many things that we don't understand. So how I introduced it was I said, okay, humans, like, you know, we think every single day. So we are using reasoning, judgment, decision-making. And this um, process is controlled by the prefrontal cortex, which is a part of the brain. And dopamine signals in the prefrontal cortex, we don't understand how it signals. And this is the question that I have. And so I never once said schizophrenia anywhere in my proposal, because I promise you if I had said schizophrenia or drug therapy, pharmacology or pharmaceutical treatments, then that would be like, oh, this is translational or this is clinical. So there's a way that you could talk about what your end goal is without actually mentioning diseases or certain outcomes of we want better treatments for, for patients. Like, no, what we want is to understand the underlying thing behind memory loss. And so with my hypothesis, this is uh, highlighted in the second blue thing. I was saying, I hypothesize that this receptor signaling in the prefrontal cortex regulates executive functioning. And then this is how I'm going to go about trying to answer that question. And also some tips with that is um, use bold and italics to highlight major points and try to use very um, precise language for your specific aims. So um, one of my specific aims was determine the behavioral effects of this dopamine receptor signaling. So what my aim was saying was I'm going to test out basically different drugs and see how mice react in different behavioral settings. Or um, the other part is I did not include figures. So Rocio actually included a figure in hers. I didn't include a figure just because I didn't think it was going to be useful for my point of like showing you a brain or showing you the receptor signaling pathway. It didn't really matter that much to what I was trying to say, but of course use your discretion. If you are proposing something that like is kind of complicated and it might help to have a visual aid, then definitely do so. And then this was the second page of my research statement. So you can also see how I kind of cheated at the bottom and I made my references like super, super small. And I like did the shortcut reference of just like author name, 
the journal and the year like I did not want to use any space at all just because you still only have two pages and then for um the last page I kind of split it into three different sections so preparation um and this was really important for me just because I did not have publication so I wanted to make sure that reviewers knew like I can I can do this project like even though I don't have publications like I'm out here like I'm a scientist and I I literally I, I do this so I said I've developed the technical skills to achieve every aspect of this proposal and then just like quickly listing things out the next part intellectual merit and so I didn't actually spend too much time on that. And I just quickly went through why is my research question useful? And I said, okay, this will enrich the understanding of dopamine signaling in the entire brain. Like this is a huge next step. And then lastly, for broader impacts, I talked about how I plan to talk about like both academic and non-academic science communication. So not only will I present at conferences, but I'm going to keep doing outreach. I'm going to keep working with the kids that I love so much. And then on top of that, another broader impact is like this problem affects people every single day. Like we need to understand dopamine because people think and you think with dopamine. So that's a broader impact. Yeah, and that's um, it for me. <laughs> um, so before I go into my research plan, I just want to answer: Is the AIM format uh, necessary? I have seen it in many samples, but I'm not sure how to describe my plan in that format. Um, I'm not sure if it's necessary, but it's highly recommended uh, just because it's a way of organizing your thoughts. Um, and they can easily, uh, you know, look at your statement and be like, okay, what's the aim of this project? I just, I don't want to skim through it and like be able to like see uh, specifically what is the main goal. And it's also good um, to structure it that way because other grants like do require that like NIH grants. So I think the reviewers are more familiar with seeing um, the structure of the grant like that. Um, so I, I, I would highly recommend to do it in that, in that way of just aims, different aims. Um, so this is my research example. I also do research that is related to disease. We work on obesity, which is a disease. Um, so I was like very kind of discouraged at the start of my second year. I was like, I don't know if I want to apply again. Like, I don't think I can make this work. Um, but my PI was like, you should do it. So I did it. And basically I just tried talking about the mechanism I was looking at in the context of obesity. Um, so we study like how adipocytes form and that is very much triggered by, you know, the intake of high fat diets or like high sugar diets, um, which ultimately leads to obesity. But um, because we're focusing on that uh, first process of like how do these cells um, proliferate and become adipocytes, I just decided to focus my shift on that and not like once they're obese, what happens? Um, and of course, like that is gonna be the, the broader impact of my project, but I just decided to focus on, on that little part. Um, so I um, also drew attention to important statements. Um, this is something that my PI recommended and I found very useful. So as you can see, the title is in uh, bold. Um, my hypothesis is also in uh, bold. And the question that I'm asking is in bold. Um, the aims uh, uh, or the broader um, issue of my aims is also like that. So just like anything that you can do to make it easier for them to look at your grant and be like, this looks organized, you know, like I can, I can find, you know, in the middle of reading, like, I don't know, dozens of these, I can take this piece of paper and quickly learn and know what, what the major points are. Um, keep your aims concise. Of course, there's like a page limit, so you kind of have to, but essentially um, I just wrote like, what is it that I'm doing? how am I doing it and what will the outcome be? So like I didn't get into, you know, I'll use this antibody uh, at this concentration uh, and unless like that is part of your, you know, like, like establishing a method as part of your um, research statement. 
Um, but I was just like, I want to learn how estrogen affects this process. And I'm going to do this experiment. I'm going to use confocal imaging and the result is going to tell me this or that. And then that will allow me to jump to my second aim uh, and elaborate on that too. So um, I just want to highlight here, I did like I did write pathology and obesity in my statement, uh, two words that are associated with disease. So I don't think there's like a particular harm on doing that, especially if you're kind of bringing it back to, you know, very subtly saying like, this is very important. However, I'm not studying that aspect, you know, I'm trying to learn this other thing about it, but it pertains to that. So I don't think you should necessarily shy away from doing that just like kind of do it in a smart way um where you're you know not focusing on that in particular um so intellectual merit and broader impacts um like when i l i you know had a section uh for that specifically because i know that's important and they, they wanna they, it's a separate like scoring thing when the reviewers are giving you a score so um just make it easy for them to find it um, in, in intellectual merit, I did focus a little bit more on my research. Um, I, I talked about how, you know, uh, it's not well known sometimes like sex dependent uh, uh, differences in, in biological mechanisms. And it's super important for us to understand that, you know, especially like the NIH made a call for like more, more uh, research in, in female mice, for example. Um, so you can talk about those things. Um, I talked about how it's going to impact the field and just overall try convincing them that it was super worth funding. And in broader impacts, I switched a little bit more to what we were talking about previously, which is, you know, if you give me this money, I will be so much more successful in my career, in my PhD. This will put me at a better standing to apply to, um, you know, competitive postdocs. And like, this will show that I know how to get my own funding. Um, it might put me in a better position to get a postdoc and um, move up and get another, you know, grant when I'm in a postdoc and then like I can be faculty, you know, I like you just bring it up to what your career goals are and how then as a faculty, for example, I was planning on impact uh, science outreach in, you know, Puerto, Puerto Rico, like I, I want to create a program to bring students from Puerto Rico to do uh, research in my lab like every year. I also want to go there and teach, you know, like just talk about all the things that you plan on doing um, with your position of power, wherever that is. It doesn't have to be in academia um, uh, where you want to be in the future. Um, so that is our research examples. Um, I don't know if we want to answer some questions and then move on to the last part. Um, So the, sorry, I'm just trying to like read through like some of these questions. Yeah. I don't know. Well, for the, okay, so for the first, I think first question that uh, sort of touches upon the research plan statement. Also, Lucy asked a bit ago, how original does a research plan have to be? How much about the methodology do you have to write about? Um, yeah. Um, I mean, I think it, it definitely needs to be something that you have to, you know, make the point that this is novel. Um, the techniques don't necessarily need to be novel, um, as long as your research question is addressing something that hasn't been addressed before. I, I don't think I used anything like super cutting edge for mine, you know, um, so I think it's more important that your, that your overall um, question is addressing something that is new. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and so Efrain, um, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names, um, I do apologize. Um, so they ask, can the research proposal be related to my current research? I've been told it would present a conflict. Um, are you, I, I'm assuming that this person is an undergrad, maybe? Uh, did not say, um, but potentially it could be like unpublished data um, where I would see maybe it might be conflict or. Um, I see, I, I guess I, 
I kind of understood it in the sense of like, if you're writing it from your undergrad uh, research, would it be a conflict because you won't be doing that actually in your in your future? That's a good. That's a good. Or if it's like your PI told you that it could be a conflict, then in that case, uh, probably no. <laughs> um, yeah, that goes into the earlier question as well. Um, okay. Yeah, so alum, alumide, alumide. I'm so, I greatly, I sincerely apologize for um, mispronouncing your name. So he asked, so as a senior undergrad, um, how do we address the resources needed for the project without having a home lab and following up if I model the statement after potential PI, would you recommend that I email that PI to discuss the idea? So that's perhaps what um, Ephraim's question was also referring to possibly. Okay. Yeah, uh, please um, elaborate on your questions in the chat box um, if we are misinterpreting your questions. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. I'm i just gonna say what I what I think uh, is happening. So. I, I don't know if it's a great idea to write it based on like a particular lab in a in a program that you you are applying to because like the, the you don't know necessarily if you're actually going to end up there or not. Um, and again, like when I all said, the NSF funds your 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 research plan, but it'll ultimately fund you. So it doesn't matter if your actual thesis won't be related to that at all. So I don't think it's that important to you know, like write it on your undergrad versus like a potential lab that you're interested in or like something that you completely just came up with yourself. Um, I know there's like pros and cons for each of those, but um, I don't think it's, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's, um, as long as, as long as it's coherent and like something that is attainable, I don't think it matters if it's coming from your undergrad institution uh, your current research, or if it's something that you would like to do, but I wouldn't focus it particularly on one lab. Maybe you know, if you're interested in a in a broader thing and you're looking at different labs, maybe you can work out something like that. But n I don't know. What What do you think? I wouldn't just do it from one lab that I'm interested in. Yeah. Also, with the interest in the lab, it are you planning on um, communicating with? the lab or the PI of the lab that you're interested in, because if they are, that would be a huge advantage. Like if you reach out to that person and it's like, hey, like I'm applying to this school um, and I'm writing about like one of your papers or one of your techniques. So at least you can get some feedback or guidance about does your project make sense? Is this plausible? Is this a good research question? But at the end of the day, um, and this also goes along with um, uh, Daniela's question as well. So when you're applying and submitting your research plan, you don't actually have to submit your own data. So um, Daniela said they have um, unpublished techniques for a task that they're doing. So it's like, you're not going to be penalized for not including data. Like I didn't include data in my proposal. You're also not gonna be penalized for just abstractly saying something. Like you don't have to say like, I will work with um, this PI or this is the person who will help me do that. I included that in mind just because I was already a second year student at that point. And so I had joined my thesis labs and I mentioned my, my co-advisors, I have two PIs, um, but you can like talk about things as purely science-based um, and saying that this is the question that I have, these are the skills that I would need to use that, this is the techniques that I plan on using. This is how I plan to acquire those skills if I don't already have them. Like you don't have to be limited by, I'm not working with this PI yet. Like you can definitely still apply. Mm -hmm. um, so Am Amanda asked a question uh, that my statement didn't have uh, a specific expected outcome section. Um, I did talk about those in the aims, so that was kind of like my conclusion for every aim. I was like, this is what we expect, and and if, it, if it's this thing, then this will happen, and if it's not this thing, then, then I'll take this other approach, um, which I think is also important to like kind of smuggle in there like a little bit alternative approach. Um, 
in case something doesn't work out. Um, okay, I am going to move on with the recommendation letters. Um, so the NSF allows you to submit or like rank, essentially you can ask five people to write you letters, um, but ultimately only three of those are going to be considered and they ask you to rank them from one to five um, and they will choose the top three that have been submitted. So essentially this allows you to have a little bit more um, flexibility uh, if you're asking uh, PIs or, or, or mentors or whatever, um, if someone doesn't submit a letter, it just allows you to like not be completely, you know, excluded from the um, uh, revision uh, or whatever. So I think we highly recommend to ask five people um, just because yeah, if someone just doesn't make it to the deadline, then you have like other letters um, that could be used too. Um, and you just have to rank those in terms of one, two, five, and they'll choose the top three. Um, so you should choose professors that can speak to your ability as a scientist. Um, so that, you know, mainly would be previous research mentors, um, but you can also ask like a, a professor that um, knew you from class, for example, um, but that can also speak to your ability as a scientist. Um, so someone that knows you well would, would probably be able to do that even though they weren't your direct research mentor. Um, as a college senior, um, hopefully you'll have, you know, your thesis advisor if you have, um, uh, you know, a thesis up research going on um, and other research uh, PIs from summer programs could also write letters for you. Um, as a grad student, it, it is recommended to have two letter writers from your current institution at least, um, and others from, you know, your previous research um, institution, undergrad, or summer programs. Um, so if you are a first year student, then uh, one, uh, in grad school applying, then one letter from the current institution is okay. Um, there are some uh, references, uh, writer tips in that link, if you're interested in looking at that. But um, overall, just to go over some of the questions I saw, just like ask people with a lot of time in advance. Uh, you don't have to ask them and have everything ready the moment you're asking them, because they're not gonna do it at that moment anyways. They always leave it for last minute. Um, so ask people that you know you want early on Tell them, I want to apply to this fellowship. Uh, the deadline is this. If I give you my application materials or if I give you information, uh, could you write that letter for me? And then once they say yes, they're already, you know, you, you have that email. So like they, then you can go back and uh, send them later on, you know, bullet points with like, you know, this particular grant, they're really looking for this. And I'm talking about these things in my personal statement and in my research statement. Um, and these are my broader impacts, you know, because some, sometimes we don't talk to these people for years. Like I still have like people from my summer programs that are writing me letters and I haven't spoken to them. I speak to them every year when I'm asking them for a letter and that's fine. You know, like, don't feel bad. That's, that's part of the job. And, you know, most of the time they're happy to help you out. Just provide them with enough information because the letter they wrote for grad school is not going to be the same one that they're going to write for the NSF. Um, even more if it's been like so many years later. So just give them enough so they can write you a good letter, but don't also bombard them. Like don't send them your three page personal statement. Cause like, it's very unlikely that they're going to read that. Um, just pick certain things that you want to highlight and want them to talk about. Um, so they should talk about, you know, how long they know you, um, what capacity they should comment on your potential to succeed in grad school, um, your, your, uh, how, how can you conduct original research if they can attest to that of your ability, uh, your communication skills, uh, probably your work ethic. How do you work with peers? How do you work in groups? Mm -hmm. uh, how, how, how able are you to mentor other people? If you have mentored other students in the lab, that's a great thing to add in the letter. 
Um, and overall, like, how are you qualified to, you know, make contributions to the discipline you're going to go um, and do your PhD in and just society in general? Um, so sometimes, you know, if, if they want to compare you, like, sometimes they like when they write, you know, out of all my trainees, like, Rocio is among the top, I don't know what percent. Sometimes they, they like to see that because it puts it in perspective in terms of like, okay, you know, this is like a, a really top um, student, uh, for example, or they can just compare you to like other students in terms of like, you know, how successful you are and, and compare it to them without mentioning names. So obviously it's just like, it just gives them an idea of like, how prepared are you to succeed in grad school? Um, so we are moving to the final slides where we just have tips and final considerations. Um, so we've mentioned a few of these, like, but we just want to re reiterate over them. The NSF funds the person, not the project. So once you have that grant, like it, it doesn't matter if you switch labs, it doesn't matter if you applied with your rotation lab and you didn't end up joining that lab. Don't feel that you have an obligation to like join that lab because they helped you write a grant. Like that is great, of course, but um, yeah, it, it, it's funding you uh, and you should be able to take that wherever you want. Um, make sure to like try to get involved in certain things or, or not. Like, you know, everyone does their own thing, but um, you know, if you're, if you at some point in your life had done any volunteer work or, or, or doing, done like science outreach, um, uh, it would be good to, to talk about those things. Um, start early. It's, I know the statements are short, but they're so like, it's just very difficult to concisely and like very, at the same time, like get your point across in just like a very limited space. So I think that was the hardest part for me, just like trying to make everything fit and be as like uh, concise as I could in, in the pages. So start early um, with the process. You should be like working on that, like even or right now. Um, a great way to get feedback is to ask graduate students at your institution um, if they have received the fellowship, just I've given my fellowship to so many people like in, in I, I feel like most of us in any capacity that we can help, like we, we will. Um, so don't be afraid to ask someone that, you know, you know, got the fellowship um, to the, to read your materials and, and to give um, their materials to you also. Have scientists outside of your discipline read it. So if you have someone that like, even like just a, a peer, you know, that is in, I don't know, a completely different field, um, it's a good way of gauging like how well written your statement is, even though they won't understand everything. If they overall like get the idea of your statement, that is like a great indication that you are writing um, and communicating effectively. Um, and again, the likelihood that scientists in your specific field or even in the field, there's like, like very broad um, research topics sometimes. Um, you're not guaranteed that you're going to get someone that knows exactly what you're doing. So that's also a good way of trying to gauge that, um, you know, how well are the reviewers or that, you know, might be reviewing this are going to actually understand it. Follow format guidelines. Follow format guidelines. Uh, I know that this year, uh, I think uh, Daisy uh, told us that they had a, a new system in place where if your formatting is incorrect, they will let you know when you're submitting, which is great because I know of many people who had, you know, like just great statements, great proposals and everything, and they didn't get funded because they, their margins weren't right or, you know, the, the font wasn't the right size or so just be very conscious about that and, and try to get it in early because, you know, if those messages come up, and you have like a one day window at least, you can fix those and, um, and submit with the right formatting. Yeah, and overall make it easy for the reviewers to read your proposal. So I think all those things kind of go to that point. Just make it easy for them, easy to understand, easy to read. And 
some final considerations about the NSF. So like we've told you like all of the good things about like the benefits and the support that you get, but there are also um, some limitations of the NSF as considered to other fellowships or grants. So the first thing is NSF is a federally funded grant, which means that like the same way how you have um, a federal budget for the entire country of the United States of America, NSF is um, worked into the federal fiscal year. So I think like last year was like $8.3 billion or something. Um, but with that, that means that you actually, um, there's something called double dipping. So you, you cannot be um, receiving multiple sources of federal money at the same time. So for example, you cannot be funded as an NSF fellow and be supported by the NIH, which is also a federal organization. So you cannot be funded by an NSF. And um, even if you successfully apply to the pre-doctoral F31 NIH grant, you couldn't have both of those sources of money at the same time. But you can um, have private organization money. So like you could be an NSF fellow, and let's say there was a nonprofit organization. So let's say there was a nonprofit cancer organization or your university had its own like dean's award or sometimes they do like endowments for professors like you can have those at the same time since that would be like federal and state or federal and university um and then also for local funding uh nsf does have some restrictions for what you can and cannot be paid for so for example I used to work with an outreach program. I used to get um, $1,000 per semester because I was doing a lot of work on the weekends with elementary school children. And um, they just would give me like $1,000 and like three little payments. But once I got the NSF, the NSF was like, well, you cannot be paid for broader impacts. Like you just, you can't. Or I also, NSF discourages you having outside employment um, but it's not necessarily prohibited. Um, they defer to your university. So some schools do have rules that like, if you are a full-time graduate student, you can't work um, and make something more than like $10,000 a year, or sometimes they break it down into hours. So it's like, you can't work an outside job for more than 10 hours a week. Um, or if your institution does like TAs or teaching assistants or research assistants, it's also sometimes called, sometimes they pay the students, but NSF might not allow you to get paid for being a teaching assistant. So those are some things to consider with the funding opportunities of like your financial situation. The next point is with annual meetings. So there are some fellowships that provide annual meetings for their fellowships. So a good example of that is the Ford Fellowship. Rocio is actually a Ford Fellow as well as an NSF Fellow, but NSF does not have an annual meeting for fellows. Um, and this can be like a good and bad thing. Like it might be a good thing in terms of you're not going to have to set aside time for like three to four days or however long these meetings usually last. But then the downside of that is you might be missing out on some networking opportunities. So if you are somebody who's looking into having networking or let's say like professional mentors or just even meeting people in other fields, the NSF is not really going to um, supplement you in that way. Along with that point with met mentoring, um, there are some fellowships and grants that assign you a professional mentor if you are selected as a fellow. An example of that is the HHMI Gilliam Fellowship. So not your PI, but there's gonna be a completely different PI who is also in HHMI or Howard Hughes Medical Institution, I don't know. Um, and so they are an HHMI funded principal investigator and they would be assigned to you like I'm going to work with you. I'm going to 
meet with you regularly. We'll talk about your scientific progress. We'll talk about what you want to do in life. And it's a good way to expand your professional network outside of your institution or just even your lab. So NSF also does not have professional mentors that are assigned to you. Like I'm sure you could go and find people yourself, but like there are fellowships that specifically um, highlight mentoring for fellows. Another point is travel funds. So the National Science Foundation NSF does not provide travel funds. So um, there are conferences and workshops that people go can go to. If you've ever been to a conference or a workshop, you know, you usually have to pay for registration, which can be a couple hundred dollars, lodging, travel, cost of materials, a per diem for like food, drink, like whatever. So there are some fellowships and grants that specifically would put aside money. So let's say $2,000 every single year, which can stretch pretty far, but NSF does not provide um, a travel fund. But the positive thing about having an NSF is your, um, stipend and your tuition is paid for. So like you could probably like convince your PI to send you somewhere. So I haven't had problems going to conferences because my PIs are like, we don't pay for you to be here. So like I can give you $1,200 to go here. And also a lot of conferences and workshops do have travel funds for graduate and undergraduate students. Um, and also even separate funds if you are an underrepresented minority student. So don't be too discouraged by the travel fund, but like NSF does not have a travel fund. And the last thing is discretionary funds. So these are funds that you can use to basically improve your quality of life as a scientist. So for example, um, somebody was tweeting the other day that they were super stressed out because they have their baby now and they're trying to do all this lab stuff. But um, some of the NIH grants, you could actually use that to pay for childcare. Or um, if you need a new laptop, for example, and you're like, oh my God, my laptop died. I can't do any work from home. I can't do anything. You could just request like $2,000 to buy a new laptop. And that's all you would have to say is, I use my laptop for research. So um, the NSF does not really have a budget for discretionary funds, but what you could do to go about that is talk to your PI directly because your PI can request materials on your behalf, like, like for your science, since technically your NSF money for your institution is um, filtered through your PI. So if you talk to your PI and you're like, I want a laptop and I don't want to pay for it myself. If your PI is like fairly understanding, they can purchase your new laptop, like with your NSF money, but you couldn't <laughs> yeah, like you couldn't re request it yourself and like be like, Hey, NSF, I want a laptop. Like they would be like, we can't help you. I, I didn't know your PI could do it for you though. It's like, I wish I'd known that two years ago. Yeah, your PI can do it like on your behalf, but like you can't contact NSF yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is definitely not like a community of NSF fellows um, like they are for other other fellowships, but you know, it, it's still a grant and it's still a great, you know, thing to have and to have in your CV and everything. So don't like shy away from applying to it. If you have options, um, then like choose what's best for you. Um, I think is, is overall what we're trying to say with like all of these considerations. Um, so um, that is pretty much it in terms of our presentation. Um, we do have a lot of resources here listed um, where you have, you know, different tips for writing as well as examples in, in all the different fields. Uh, Scientifico Latino has like an amazing database uh, for not just the NSF, but like pretty much like, I don't know, at least every other fellowship I've heard about in terms of grad school. Um, they have really good examples there. So it's a great resource to go and just look at some of these and, and see what's common between them, what what you liked, and just try to emulate that when you're writing your own. Um, yeah, I think we have some outstanding questions still. Yep. So 
So um, actually, so yeah, first off, I want to thank everyone tuning in uh, for spending wherever you guys are over here in the East Coast. It's evening time, um, the morning, wherever you are, afternoon. I know that it's gone well beyond like the 1.5 hour mark. So thank you. Um, also, Rosie and Gwen for, for, for this. Um, so Charlotte, so I kept this one. And so Charlotte asked a great question that the three of us have also discussed regarding like the broader impact section, I believe. And so um, they ask, um, as a first gen student uh, or American, how did you balance your, or incorporate into your personal statement, you know, experiences, you know, surrounding your personal identity and your career interests? Great question. Yeah, I can go first. Um, so like my identity is so important to me and is extremely important for like my purpose in science. And I always preface every single thing with is like, I'm an Afro-Latino woman. So it's like, I'm always going to care about black people. I'm always going to care about Latinx people. I'm also queer. So like, there are just, there are a lot of things that I care about. And then along with that, at. like you have health disparities you have underrepresentation in so many different areas so it's like I choose to be hyper visible like I will mm -hmm. always do things with elementary school students I will always do things with middle and high school just because when I was in that age or when I was in that point in my life I didn't see people who look like me I didn't see people who spoke like me or um even came from my similar background so in terms of balancing that with not just like my life today but then also with my personal statement I don't think that there's any shame in saying those things and just being proud of who you are of like these are all of the things I've had to overcome to get here and for example when I talked about like I didn't have any publications I didn't have any um uh cumulative research like i made sure to include that like yo um hello i'm poor like i had to work when i was in college and if you want to hold that against me that like i could not do research for free because like i had to work like then a lot of the times i think it manifests in ways of what's for you is for you or you know like que sera, sera, like what will be will be and you have to be comfortable and confident that like things that are for you will present themselves and have pride in the things that are important to you. And also when I found my mentor, so like Dr. Jarasa like is a black man. So a lot of the times I don't have to sit here and hide things because he knows the things that are important to me. He knows that I'm always gonna be doing outreach. He knows I work with scenes of people like, you know, like he knows I also work with black and neuro my other PI, Mark, like, he's so cute, like, um, he'll be like, oh my goodness, like, there's a conference in Canada, you should apply, there's so many Haitians in Canada, and it's like, like, I found mentors who also take interest in the things that I take interest in, and you can also weave that into your career interests, as well as I want to be a role model, I want to help bring people up, I want to keep reaching back into my community, and if people don't support that again, like that's not the space that you need to be in like period. Exactly. And I'll, I, I've just talked a lot. So I'm gonna turn over to Rocio. <laughs> no, I think it's, you know, it's, it might be difficult if you're looking at it now, but like once you sit down and start writing like really about your feelings, it'll come, you know? So don't be afraid of like letting it out and like, then go back and edit whatever you want, but just like doing that little, just let it out and, and whatever comes is, is valid. Like that's what you, your sentiments are. That's what your experiences are. That's what you're feeling. Um, so yeah, I, I think it, for me, it was more of like when I first came to a school in the U S I was just like, what the hell? Like, no, everyone is the same in Puerto Rico. Like everyone is Hispanic. Everyone is looks you know, we look different, but like everyone is the same in that sense of the culture. And so like, I don't think I ever thought of myself as a minority until I had to come here. And then I was like, oh, like, oh, this is what it feels like, you know, this is what it is. I just, it was completely new for me. 
And I was super discouraged um, because like no one, like I still look around and at Yale, there's like no, mm -hmm. almost no Latina like faculty. And it's like, you have to stop and ask yourself like, why? And like, if you think about that too much, like it, it, it might discourage you. And it's like, to me, like it, I, go, I go back and forward. I go like, why haven't other women like me been able to get there? Um, but it also fuels me, you know? So you can talk about that too. It's like, oh no, like I, I wanna make a change in that way. I wanna be the example that I didn't have. I wanna create more connections so that other, um, you know, you know, Lat Latinx and, and black uh, people, like everyone can feel like they belong in the space, you know? So you can certainly tie it up to your career goals. Like if that is something that is important to you, um, that's super valid and, and it's, it's great to talk about those things, so. Thank you for sharing, you two. Yeah, and great question, Charlotte. Yeah. Um, I guess we have two two questions, um, two short questions. So these are the these are the last two. And and um, Kenneth asks, is a research proposal for something like target drug delivery not recommended? Um, mm. Is it? I'm trying to think if it's like if you're trying to maybe if you're talking maybe about how you're gonna try to understand this thing that happens via this method um i think it's potentially like i think it's viable i don't i don't know enough about like drug delivery systems to see how much you can like separate it from the actual uh disease or, or whatever it is that it is intent to um yeah, yeah, so I think, um, and this is just me as like a fifth year PhD speaking now. Um, I honestly believe that like you can frame most questions to reflect basic science regardless of what you're doing. So like for targeted drug de delivery, if you frame it as not we want to um better improve this drug therapy to improve the health outcomes of insert disease here but like we want to understand the signaling behind um targeting gene expression in this tissue or we want to understand how these proteins interact in this model like you can frame things multiple multiple different ways to reflect basic science questions while keep, still keeping the integrity of your research question. Mm -hmm. And that's something that uh, is really useful to have like a mentor or just an advisor who is well versed in, in that area who can help you figure out the language of your specific project while also making it appeal to basic science audiences. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah there's always a way to kind of do that um, mm -hmm. okay yeah thank you thank you guys so much um so yeah i don't want to take up any more of your time if there are any questions that you you have um please uh, feel free to email um scientificalatino at gmail.com so i'll list that in the chat box right now um, and also for the for the ones of viewing on YouTube, uh, we'll also be dropping it down in the description um, box uh, below the video. Um, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Thank you, Rocio Guineo. Um, I can't express like I love you guys so much, and so I, I learned so much from from just practicing with you guys. Uh, and and, and truly, I hope everyone has learned just as much as I have from from your webinar. Um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for being here and giving us the opportunity. And thank you guys. Um, we also have upcoming webinars on other fellowships and Rocio is giving a, a webinar on the Ford Predoctoral Fellowship, um, September 17th. And so, yeah, tune in for that. Look up um, the scientificalatino.eventbrite.com 
for additional webinars. So yeah, all right. Thank you guys. Yes. Thank <music> you.